one. So it's a Saturday night. And we have some BMX thing going on in town as well, so we are 100% full. On mornings like this, the morning FDA goes through all the reservations for the day and charges the guest credit cards for the rooms. Any guest who has their card declined is called and emailed about it. No answer? Your reservation is cancelled and given to someone else. This happens fairly frequently with guests through booking who want to pay cash. So they put down a credit card they know has no money on it. Story. So I get to work at 3pm for my evening shift, and the no vacancy sign is already up. Oh boy. The FDA tells me that four reservations were cancelled, because they got declined and didn't answer our calls or emails. Like clockwork, one of the guests comes in an hour later, who happened to be one of the people who had their card declined, and their reservation cancelled. But it's his birthday. Should have thought of that before you had no money on your card. They started yelling at me that they weren't called. <clears throat> and they made the reservation a month ago. They also want me to comp them a free suite, the room they initially booked, and threatened a bad review if I didn't fix things right now. Well, I tell them there's nothing I can do. I want to speak to your manager. There was one cancellation for a single smoking room that they didn't want, since they weren't smokers. They eventually gave up, and leave to their car. While they are still in their car, a person comes in and asks if we have any rooms. I tell them about the one bed smoking room we have left, and they take it. Right as I'm finishing checking them in, the angry couple comes back wanting that single smoking room. Literally five seconds after I finished checking this other person into that room, boy were they not happy. I will update this thread as more stories come along. Edit. It's been an hour and all's quiet, other than some nice old ladies who can't work the TV properly. Still got three hours until my shift ends. Edit 2. 9.46pm. Alright. My woes have diverted to an internet problem. I'm skilled in computers and solving problems, but this one is beyond me. 2. Still having remnants of adrenaline in my body, but I've calmed down enough to write about this. I am working night audit this week, and it's usually exceptionally dead in this period. It's a small hotel in Norway, with mostly groups staying one night at a time. Anyway, I am preparing breakfast, listening to a podcast at 3.30 in the morning, when I hear my bell go off. Our desk bell is connected to a phone I carry on me when I'm not at the desk. Now that might not be weird for most NAs, but here it's a little unusual because no one is ever at the desk until breakfast is about to start. I am met by a woman in her early 40s who has a slight look of agony on her face and says she has some pain in her chest. Me, okay, would you like me to call an ambulance? The doctor's clinic in town is closed until 8am, Nearest hospital is a one-hour drive. Hotel is located in the middle of nowhere. Woman. No, no. I've had this before. I'm sure it will pass. Can I have a glass of hot water, please? I give her the glass of hot water, and she sits down in the lobby. I tell her that if I can help her with anything, the slightest, that she should ring the bell again. I continue making breakfast, but... Just can't shake this uneasy feeling that some kind of shit is about to go down. I go check on her again to make sure she is okay. Tells me she is feeling fine and that I shouldn't worry. Okay, good. I go back to preparing breakfast again and after about five minutes my bell alarm goes off. I rush downstairs and she is holding her chest and looking like she is in great pain. She asks me to call the tour director who is with her group and I do so. While I have the tour director on the phone, I look away for a second. I hear a big thump. Woman is gone. Shit. My head kicked into overdrive, and to be honest, I panicked. I somehow fumbled my hands into my pocket and dialed the Norwegian equivalent of 911 and see her lying on the ground in front of the desk, pale as chalk and lifeless. Someone just had a heart attack in the middle of the night in the middle of fucking nowhere, and I am alone. I had to do something. 
I don't really know why, but I remember being angry at her. Snowflakes and other horrible guests are one thing. But you gave me a heart attack to deal with? No fucking way are you dying on my watch, lady. What the fuck? In all of the hassle of giving mouth to mouth and cracking her ribs the best I remembered, I have emergency services on the phone trying to calm me down. I had to put the phone on speaker because I was too busy not wanting her to die that I probably sounded very stressed and desperate. Finally, the tour director comes running down the corridor in his PJs and takes over so I can continue talking in more detail. We take turns until the ambulance finally arrives 12 minutes after I initially called, which is super quick around here. And they rush into the reception with a defibrillator and by some goddamned miracle, she starts breathing again. Thank fuck. I could not have been more relieved. I was shaking. I needed to lay the fuck down. After the personnel secure her, stabilize, or whatever they do, the helicopter arrived at the hotel and they took the lady away. The ground rescue personnel were so nice, told me I did a great job and tried to calm me down after. But I just couldn't do anything else than cry. I was shattered. My body felt so heavy. That shit scared the bejeebas out of me. I am a young early twenties guy who has never had these kind of emergencies happen around him. I was surprised my brain remembered how to do CPR. That shit was buried deep. You don't think you'll ever need to use it, right? I am just glad she didn't die. 3. So it finally happened. I had my first eviction last night. It's been a little over a year since I joined the industry, and may I just say, thank you, Tales from the Front Desk. Since I discovered you a few months into the job, you have been my savior. Here I can share my pains with others who know them all too well. It was another sold out Saturday with constant phone calls, asking if we had availability, we don't, learn to plan ahead, and drunk wedding groups. One such wedding group decided to host their own personal reception in their economy-sized double queen room. As soon as I clock in, I hear them cheering about something and let them know to keep it down. An hour later, I do the same. We have a three-strike policy, and when 11.30 rolled around, I should have kicked them out then and there, but I felt generous and didn't want to stir the pot with a wedding party. So I warn them that if I have to talk to them again, I will evict the room. Another half hour, another complaint. That's it, final warning. Another half hour, another agitated neighbor of a room nearby. And this time I prepare myself and decide it's over. I'm greeted with assurances that it's done with, promises of lights out, and glossy puppy eyes staring up at me. Absolute last chance. I'm printing out some paperwork and from the desk I hear singing and music. I mute the television to see if it's coming from that. No, it's coming from down the hall where their room is. I walk down the hall and find their door wide open. A yuppie looking douchebag is sitting on a bed, playing an acoustic guitar and singing at the top of his lungs. All his drunk fans are circled round him, eagerly listening with their backs to the open door. He is mid-chorus, singing his heart out with his eyes closed. Enough! I'm evicting this room. You all have 20 minutes to leave or I will call the cops. The drunk fans turn and gasp and then snap their heads quickly back at the sound of a guitar string snapping, and then once more back to me. The timing was so beautiful. I turn and start back to the desk, and I'm followed by several of the drunks, who once more plead and promise all whilst trying to shake my hand and call me sir in an effort to appease me. No, I've given more warnings than I should have already. It's done. 25 minutes later, I knock on the door. Everyone has cleaned out except for a 50-year-old man and woman. I tell them that I have evicted this room and they must leave now. I'm not fucking leaving. Go ahead and call the cops. With pleasure, sir. He is properly escorted out of the building, the woman having disappeared. The cops even gave me the honor of knocking. Then, in a rage, the drunk fool decides to try sneaking by the cops and driving away. Justice. 
with a side of life ruining DUI charges. 4. This all happened about two years ago, give or take a few months. At the time, I was one of the hotel bar managers. I'm not sure if this fits here, but it was within a hotel. So I had to follow a certain protocol I wouldn't normally at previous bars I've worked. The hotel would host a series of weddings and the wedding parties would typically start out or end up at our bar most Friday and Saturday nights. While we would like to accommodate these guests, we would usually already be at capacity. Our hotel bar always had live jazz style music and singing on the weekends until 1am, but closed at 2. Suffice it to say, we always had a strong local following. They still do. This night in particular, the brother of a certain tight end, of a certain Super Bowl champion, decided they wanted to have their wedding at our hotel. Cool. Lots of cash flow. Lots of guests even after the music dies down at 1, when most people left the bar. Their party bus arrived back at the hotel around 12.30. We were still at capacity, so we could only let in a few people at a time. They were livid, so upset that the fact that they were guests of the hotel, had a wedding at the hotel, but weren't reserved 100 seats in the bar for whenever they decided they wanted to come back and drink. Our capacity was only 160, so for the next 30 minutes, all I heard was how awful I was for not letting Drunkowskis in. Do you know who they are? On repeat. When the music let up and they were finally able to come inside, the group for the most part was intolerable sans a few nice people thankful for the service. Last call comes around 1.45. That glorious time, or so I think. This was my first management position, so the other manager liked to put me in situations where I would learn how to handle them. He would coach me through and then stand close by. He knew the shit would hit the fan. I turned off the music, turned up the lights, and stood behind the bar waiting for my guys to close up. Ready to step in at any moment. A few Bronskis make their way to the bar. They proceeded to order another round of drinks, ignoring the last call I made five minutes prior. I inform them liquor sales are over since we close at two. They have until 2.15 to finish whatever they are drinking. For the next 10 minutes, this one guy in particular decided to tell me several times over who this group of people were there for. Do you know who he is? Do you know who he is? Other bars here stay open until we tell them we are done. You guys should do the same. We want to party. You'll be sorry. I'll have your job. You don't understand who he is. Super Bowl champion, baby! I respond calmly that state law requires me to stop serving at a certain time, or I, personally, could be fined. The bar could be fined and lose their liquor license, and I'd likely lose my job. This guy offers me a good tip if I let it slide this one time. Earlier I was checking with the bartenders to see how well they tipped. Shop talk. Those good tips averaged about one dollar, so... Nah... I stood my ground and told the guy we were finished with the conversation. He then told me he spoke with my manager already, and they said it was fine to keep service going. Relentless much? Being a tiny girl in a skirt behind the bar wasn't very intimidating to these football player types. I crossed my arms, laughed at the guy, and told him the other manager and I are on the same page with how we run the bar. After all, I was manager on duty at the time. I told him nice try, reminded him of the minibar in the room, and then asked them to finish their drinks and move out to the lobby. At that point, our 6'2", 300-plus pound security guy came in to check on me. A few choice words were slung back at me, coupled with reminders of whose company I was missing out on. They'd never come back to the bar again, and they'd make sure to let the general manager know of this travesty. Oh boy. 2.30 rolled around. And they were finally all out. We locked up the doors, turned off the lights, and enjoyed a round of beers. Laughed a little at the amount of testosterone floating around. We served that same group the following night with no hassle. And what do you know? I kept my job after they checked out of the hotel.
5. I come in from my audit shift last night, as I always do, and I see the person I'm relieving has that look. You know that look. The look where you know it's going to be the night from hell. So anyways, co-worker tells me a guest that we've had, I'll call him Billy Methad, for a few days now is high out of his mind. She also mentions that she can see the race tracks from heroin on his arms. Great. I start checking cameras to see if I can find the dude. And I see him aimlessly walking around the parking lot. So of course it's my job to get him back to safety. Specifically his room where I tell him to sleep it off. I retreat to my desk to watch my favorite sport team do what they do best. Lose. Not ten minutes later, a different guest comes down to tell me that Billy Methhead has somehow managed to get free of his room. And was harassing him and his son. I grab the portable phone and I'm off. I catch up to Billy Methhead and try to coax him back to his room. That sounds easy, right? Hell no. Billy Methhead wanted to tell me about the big guy in the sky with a computer and joystick that's controlling the entire world. I once again take him to his room and retreat. At this point, I'm forced to watch the cameras to babysit the guy. I once again find him wandering the parking lot. I had every right to evict this guy, but he was mostly harmless and I sure as hell didn't want him trying to drive in this condition. Grab portable, grab cell phone in case the fit hits the shan. Get outside and hear Billy Methhead mumbling about a clown and the sheriff. I begin escorting him back to his room. And it's obvious Billy Methhead is starting to trip, so I calmly talk to him and tell him we can worry about the clown and the sheriff in the morning, when he wakes up. I've already decided this is the last time I'm dealing with this guy. As I'm writing up the text to my boss that I'm probably going to be calling the police tonight, I look at the camera and see Billy Methhead walking the halls knocking on doors and possibly talking to paintings. Police get called. Skip to 20 minutes later, and two sheriffs arrived. I kind of chuckled to myself given the earlier conversation. They talk to him and decide to roll medical, and tell me to get his girlfriend to the lobby. EMS shows up and everyone leaves, finally some quiet. That is until three hours later when his girlfriend comes back to the hotel. She asks me for a room key and I ask if Billy Method is okay. She says he is and that some of his medications were interacting poorly. I'm normally pretty non-judgmental, but it took everything I had not to tell her that heroin isn't a medication. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Confessions of a Hotel Worker number 5. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. You know the story there with the uh, don't you know who I am people. Uh, I've never worked in a hotel or a bar, but I've certainly, uh, I've certainly dealt with many, many, many drunk people. And I've had to refuse some service on numerous occasions. It's never a pleasant thing. Now remember one guy, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but uh, he came in, uh, did the business, I was like, sorry, can't serve you, you've had enough to drink. No, I haven't. Well, no, okay, but I'm not serving you anyway. And uh, usually that, what you do is you kind of take, you take off and with a pack of four uh, cans of lager or some such. So I take it off and put it to the side. So he then walks away, picks up another four cans and walks back over, tries to get me to serve him again. Or maybe he was expecting somebody else, but I was the only person actually serving on the till at that point. Uh, even the supervisor has to tell him, look, mate, he's already told you, no, you're not getting served. See, the main problem is certain type of people, especially when they're very drunk, they think that the rules that everybody else follows don't apply to them. They think they're special, or just this once, doesn't matter. Because they don't really give a fuck about you or your job. Either they'll, they'll insult you, they'll yell at you, somehow thinking that's, that's going to get you to serve them after you've calmly refused them. And the thing is, we who actually work in these places, be it a, be it a store that sells booze, a pub, a hotel, whatever it may be, we don't actually personally care whether you get drunk or not means nothing to us on a personal level it's just you know the law is the law and like that person said they could find personally the the place could lose their license 
And no matter how much you think you deserve a drink, Mr. Drunky Drunk, it's really not worth anybody losing their job over. But these people don't really care about that. Because the rules, well, they're just something that everybody else does.